<laughs> yeah, it's always good until until you hear the word, right? <laughs> oh, especially today. God is good. Amen. Keith, all the, all the time. And all the time? That's better. That's better. God's promises are amazing. Keith talked to us Wednesday about uh, the parts of the Bible we like to skip over. Because uh, even though he's good, sometimes there's some things we like to not know about God. <laughs> but the Bible is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us. <laughs> <Right. laughs> this means we can't decide what parts we want to believe and what parts we don't. And obviously that means I'm coming to you today with great words of encouragement. <laughs> Let's turn to Matthew ten sixteen. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be you therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. I didn't hear any amens. <laughs> Let's go to verse 21. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Even less amens. <laughs> Second Timothy 3.12 Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I'm just waiting for it this time. We getting it? <laughs> John 15.18 Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm going too fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you t I told you it might be 40, and you said no. <laughs> John fifteen eighteen. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will also keep yours. Ah, the promises of God. <laughs> it's heartwarming, right? God is good. Hey, all right. I wasn't sure if we were going to get that one. <laughs> but where am I going with this? God did not say your life would be easy. God commands us to go out and preach to the world. He doesn't say it's all going to be rainbows and unicorns. <laughs> he specifically says they will hate you for it. In some cases, they will even kill you for it. And God still commands that we walk straight into their hands. Jesus sent us, and he told us to go, and he told us this will happen. God's got a plan. We are part of that plan. So why is there suffering? Why is there persecution? It's because we're not where we belong. We're in a world that's ruled by the devil. They don't want the truth. They hate the truth. And that's exactly what you're bringing. God gives us all free will out of love. And that means some people use that free will to hurt others. We know God works everything together for good. So when bad things happen, we know that good's going to come of it. Persecution of God's people often leads to others being saved. Let's turn to Daniel 3.16. We have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve 
is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. They were thrown into a fiery furnace because they didn't worship a statue of a non-existent God. And their defiance changed the law. Without them being thrown into the fire, nothing would have changed. God could have even allowed them to die and still made a change. But he chose to save them that day. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were already going to heaven. They were at peace with the circumstance because they had nothing to fear. Death had no hold on somebody who has their eyes on eternity. Let's turn to Acts 7.59. I'll give you a little more time this time. <laughs> oh, I guess you got to use your real Bibles. <laughs> And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. What came of this? Well, first, Stephen went to heaven. That's key for you to understand. He didn't just die. He got to be re reunited with Jesus. In the next chapter, Saul is continuing the persecution of the church. And this causes disciples and his, his uh, followers to scatter. So Philip goes to Samaria and preaches Christ to them. And verse 6 says, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spoke hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies that were lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. And he was scattered there due to persecution. In Acts 16, starting in verse 29, Paul and Silas were thrown in jail for preaching, while they're in jail, they're praising God. Starting in verse 29, it says, Then he called for a light and sprang in. This is the, the jailer as he sees the, uh, the jail was opened up. And came in trembling and fell before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved and your house. And they spoke unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. One more. Luke 23, starting in 43. Sorry, let's go to start in verse 39. I wrote 43, but I'm at 39. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the malefactors, which were hanging, railed on him, saying, if you be the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuked him, saying, Do not fear God. Do you not fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we received the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, Today, you will be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw this, and saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, certainly this was a righteous man. People were saved in every one of the scenarios. Not all the persecuted were delivered from the persecution that day, though. They weren't all saved from death. But there are the sweetest words you can hear. 
Verily I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is better than any deliverance because you don't have to come back to any more pain. And our eyes should stay on eternity. If you were to go back in time, around the time where the disciples were being killed, if you were a doubter of what was being spoken, you said, oh sure, Jesus was raised from the dead. You're going to think, you're just deceiving us. I never saw him. Where is he now? Then they start killing the disciples for saying it. But they keep saying it. Even unto death. And then praying for you to be forgiven while you're killing them just for telling you the truth. How can you deny at that point that that person at least believed everything they said? And if they told you they saw Jesus, they saw him. You can't deny it anymore. People don't die for something they know is a lie. You couldn't possibly still think they're lying at that point. Just couldn't. There's a method to the madness, a purpose to the pain, and God works all things together for good. The worst thing the world can do to you is the best thing that can happen to you. Eternity in heaven. Pastor? <laughs> How's your week been going? Good? Anybody? <laughs> Do this. See if you're still breathing. Let's check check your check yourself. Is that program updated yet? Don't you hate updating? Is that what that is, the update? No. It's dead. It's dead. Technology. Come on. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Keep praying for Steve, right? Pakistan. Been there what, three days, four days now? Was he there 17 days? Yeah. So, a lot of persecution there. Remember uh, last week we prayed for a gentleman in Baltimore, Daniel Eaton? He had a tumor on his brain. He was walking yesterday. He's speaking, but not clear, so just keep praying for him. Yeah. Yeah, amazing, yeah. <clears throat> All right, you guys ready? You want to stand? You want to stretch a little first? You All right, let's go. Let's not move. Let's go if you want. There you go. <laughs> All right, sit down. That's enough. That's enough of that. <laughs> By the way, you guys see the new addition to the coffee in the back? A little tea, little tea set up there, a little tea counter, and yeah. By the way, that is not for you to take home. It's for a cup. Yeah. Good to see Edith in the back. Edith, we ran across Edith in outreach yesterday. This is how it happened. The, okay, every, the group's going out, and I'm getting my stuff together. And then I go, I hear, Pastor Ken. And just blew it off. Got my stuff together, start, shut the trunk, started walking around. Pastor Ken. God? God? You know? And uh, it's like I heard a voice but see no person, you know? So, and then uh, Edith came out and tracked me down. And she goes way back with us. I mean, even way, I mean, 
Yeah, yeah, so she's an amazing woman of God. And it's so good to see her. All right, let's do this. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In your Bibles. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this portion, for this word, a word that can speak to our hearts so personal and so intimately that it gives us a brand new vision and it starts to work a transformation in our hearts. And, um, and we thank you, Father, that you stretch us, that you bring us into other directions in our walk. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Verse 18 it says, for the preaching of the cross to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer? And we're live. Where is the disputer of this world? Have not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? By the way, look how many times it says foolish in here. Uh, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews required a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews, a stumbling block. Under the Greeks, foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Yeah. Yeah. The cross has a message. It has a message to those who are saved, but it also has a message to those who are foolish. <laughs> it's the same cross. It's a completely different message. Unto those that are saved, it is the power of God. And unto those who are perishing, it is foolishness. This word foolishness, and by the way, six times here, let me give you two more. Um, but it, it means muros uh, in the Greek, and it just means that it's just dull. The message of the cross to those who are perishing is nothing but dull. It also stems into the word of being stupid. I like that word. <laughs> Just saying. They're stupid. This, is, this ain't me saying, I would say it. But this is God saying it. This is God saying it. That people that don't understand the cross are pretty stupid. Because of what's entailed. But let me give you two more verses. So um, second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, just over... In my Bible, it's just turning a page. 2 verse 14, it says, But the natural man receives not the Spirit of God. The natural man, by the way, is the, the person who is not saved, unregenerated. That is natural. They live in their natural feelings, their own affections. Everything's natural. But to that person, the natural man cannot receive the Spirit of God, for it's foolish to him. And, and, they, and they cannot know because they are spiritually discerned. So it's not that they, um, they, they can't know, but they can't even receive the Spirit of God because it's all, everything's just foolishness. Um, 1 Corinthians 3, one chapter over, verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. The wisdom of this world and, and when we look at wisdom, 
it's like, you know, you could say, wow, he, he has a lot of wisdom. He speaks in a, a different, you know, it's, but it's, it's really breaks down to our own decisions and choices we make. Are you depending on God for even your choices? We should. Last week we spoke about knowledge and we spoke about understanding and those things lead to wisdom. I can know things, but if I'm not putting it into practice, there's no wisdom. It's just head knowledge. It it doesn't go far, you know. There's so much you can do with two plus two. I mean, you know, well, you can keep saying it. Hey, I know two plus two. You can go around. Look how look how wise I am, you know. Okay, but um, but wisdom is especially when it's led by the Holy Spirit. Um, is when we start to know the heart of God. And, and that becomes beautiful. And in that process of knowing wisdom, I start to be broken. And, and that's another thing with believers. It's like, oh yeah, I was broken 15 years ago. Well, what about now? Can we allow the word of God to break us now? We don't want to be so hard that we cannot be broken. Because it's your, your Christianity will be so comfortable and familiar, and you'll you'll be looking at everything according to the flesh, which we are told not to do. We don't look at each other according to the flesh. We don't. I don't want to know people according to the flesh. We must know them after the Spirit of God. We must know them after the power of God. So. Um, so this wisdom, and the Bible talks about two types of wisdom in um, James 3, uh, 15. It says the wisdom, there's, there's wisdom from above and there's wisdom from below. That's it. By the way, it doesn't say there's wisdom in the classroom and it's wisdom in the college. No, it's one's from above and one's from below. And the one from below, it says, is earthly, sensual, and devilish. In other words, it's it's worldly, sexual, or lustful, or demonic. That's wisdom from below. This is what the world operates in. This is where they go for their education. This is where they go for their knowledge. This is how they communicate. This is how they interact. This is what their decisions are based upon. And a lot of times it's now even crept into the church because people don't want messages on the cross. They want messages to make them feel good. And I need to feel good to make it to next week. And it's part of the wisdom of the world. The world tells you you need to feel that way. But the wisdom from above, the wisdom from above, and and it goes with this list, and, and it's amazing. It's an amazing list. It says the wisdom from above is, and it starts off with pure, the purity of God. And, um, and that's beautiful. In Matthew, what is it, 5, 8, it says, um, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's That's beautiful. This is where I want this is where I want to receive wisdom from from the purity of God to us. The second one is peaceable and that's good too. Does your choices and do your decisions do they 
are they geared toward extending peace? Because there's a lot of division. There's division in homes. There's division in, the, in our communities. There's the division in the world. Look at the wars going on, folks. You think people are at peace? <laughs> there's so much separation of people. Only the Bible brings them together in unity. And so there's the blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God, Matthew 5, 9. Amazing. The third one is wisdom from above is gentle. Yeah. We need to have a gentle spirit in all areas of our lives. Be, having a gentle spirit removes negativity, removes harshness, argumentative, um, proving I'm right, making a point, taking a stand, you know. This is what we think we have to do. It's funny how in uh, Galatians 5.22, one of the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. It's who God is. And he was very gentle with you when he saved you. <laughs> the gentleness of God. Four, uh, is that four? Or did I do three? Um, full of mercy. Wisdom from above is full of mercy. And this is so wonderful because this is how you, we are saved. We deserve judgment, and he gave us mercy. He extended grace to us. The Hebrew word is hased. It's the loving kindness of God for mercy. And, and mercy is, is way beyond us <laughs> because we shouldn't receive it, but God does it anyway. And... Um, in the Bible, it is always related, most of the time, to forgiveness. And we all know forgiveness, right? We, at least we know of it. We all know that we have to forgive until you're the one that, who has to forgive. When you're the one that has to forgive, somehow we forget it. Because we say they don't deserve it. I'm not going to forgive that person. And we live in misery because of it. And our heart becomes hard because of it. And we don't show mercy and we can't forgive. And we allow what people do to offend us. And that's not living in forgiveness. Oh... Uh, And then it says, without partiality, right? Wisdom from above, without partiality. I don't pick and choose who I want to befriend. J Jesus said, love thy neighbor. That's not the person next door. It really encompasses everyone. <laughs> who I come in contact with that day is now my neighbor. And then without hypocrisy, I think, is the next one. I, I think there's even more, but I think, I think you guys get it. But, you know, we can't tell people to forgive and love, and we're not. <laughs> you're, what you believe in hasn't gotten a hold of you. You're just quoting which means there's, no, there's knowledge of it, but there's no wisdom of it. So wisdom from above and wisdom from below. That's a beautiful thing. Study that. Study that in James. Matter of fact, that's in the same chapter in James that it talks about controlling your tongue. <laughs> then he's going to go into wisdom. You know, and, uh, and I love how he says control the tongue first 
Because if we can't do that, how, how are you going to have wisdom at all? You can't even, you can't, we got to start here, you know, in other words, yeah, yeah. So this is, um, this is the message to them that perish, that the cross is foolishness. It's a, it's a foolish message. But to them that believe, it is the power of God. And um, I, I, I think, or I'm pray, and um, it's just... Uh, the Spirit is like you know, convicting me in my heart that we are not living in the power of God. We're living in what we're going through. Everything is what's happening in my life that dictates what I am. But the power of God rises above all of that. And um, and I just want to go over some of this. You know, like... Um, Romans 1 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel for in it is the power of God to them that are saved. There's that power of God. And, and this is so amazing. The power of God is so incredible. It's so great that it, it even takes me and you to heaven all the way. <laughs> the power of God takes us all the way to heaven. And, um, and the power of God dealt with my sins at the cross. And it tells me I'm forgiven. And, 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 I, and I think some of us know this, but we don't because we continue to live in our flesh. Oh, but this is just the way I am and I'm struggling. No, no. When Christ died on the cross, he gave you power over all of that. That is your old life. That's your old nature. We're still fellowshipping with the old and we're not living in the new because we don't know the power of God in my own life. And I become weak under the elements of the wisdom of the world. Let me... Uh... Let's, let's talk about this power of the cross, the power of the cross. It's the place where Christ died. And the Bible says where Christ died, you died also. <laughs> it's um, uh, Romans 6, 7, and 6, 11. And Christ died once. He died once. But now he lives forevermore. <laughs> and you died with him. And now we live to newness of life. Let me let's let's think about that that cross. The cross. Very close. But on, on this is where, on the cross itself, is where the judgment of God poured out. He poured out his judgment on the cross. He poured out his wrath on the cross. All of that was poured out on the cross. That place. It's the place where Christ shed his blood. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So not alone judgment and wrath were on the cross, but so was Jesus there. He was there too. Receiving all the judgment, receiving all the wrath of God. Far beyond anything that you could even think of what was taking place. 
And his blood covered the entire cross, I believe. From the top of the cross to the bottom of the cross. And that blood ran down the entire cross and ran down into the ground, into the ground that he created. His blood ran and seeped into that ground. Yeah, exactly. The propitiation for our sins, the mercy seat. At the top of the cross, there was a crown of thorns that was pushed into his head. And Satan wanted to use that to uh, seep poison into his mind, the poison from the thorns, into his mind so he would not have the mind of Christ, or the mind of God. And we have the mind of Christ because of that. And even with all that, he would still say, even when God turned his back, he would say, forgive them, they know not what they do. Because he had the heart of God. He creates wisdom from above for us to live in. This is why in uh, Proverbs 4, it says, get wisdom. Proverbs 4, 5, get wisdom. Proverbs 9, 1, it says wisdom is building a house. God's building a house within you, fashioning you. And you look at his hands were outstretched as far as the east is to the west. And those hands were nailed to the cross the hands that went and embraced people, prayed over people, healed people, comforted people, his his hands, the hands of Christ. And his feet were nailed to the bottom. And uh, amazing where those feet traveled. They traveled into Samaria to to deal with the woman at the well. They took the gospel message. They took the good news. They brought hope to villages and cities. They went to Bethany. They walked all the way to Bethany to raise Lazarus. The feet carry him. The feet that take the good news. but all nailed. And Satan would believe that that nailing would keep him there and hold him there. And this is a picture of our old sin nature because we were crucified with Christ. But we believe that we're still there too because we have these issues and these problems and we, uh, the, the enemy continues to bring up our past and our failures. But that's not you no more. That's your, your old nature. Thank God for the new creation. And we must spend time in that new creation or you're going to get swallowed up in your problems. You're going to have depressions. You're going to say it's too much. It's too hard. It's too difficult. I can't do it. I can't go on no more. I can't, I can't, I can't. You've got the power of God within you. Wow. Yeah, that's it, it, it's something. So the we preach Christ crucified. And for the preaching of the cross or the message of the cross to those who are saved it is the power of God. You don't have to ask for it. You have it. It's not something we look for or don't have yet. If you are saved, you're equipped with it. It's realizing it. It's like, what am I going to live in now? 
Wisdom above or wisdom from below? Because it is, like Brian said, it is your choice. And same thing in to live in your feelings. You want to live in your feelings and live in your emotions, or do you want to live in the promises of God and the power of God? I don't need excuses anymore. I've got the power of God. I don't need to live in fear and anxiety and stress anymore. It's there, but I'm not going to live in it. I'm going to choose to live in the power of God. I can live in that victory. I can, I, I, I'm, I'm an overcomer because he overcame. It's reprogramming my mind to think on things above. We're not from below. There's, um, let me see here. Um, uh, let me wrap this up. John chapter 8, I think, could be 6. Yeah, it's 8, I'm pretty sure. Let me get there. <clears throat> yeah, verse 23. And he said unto them, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. And because we are in Christ, we are not like we are not of this world anymore. Boy, we want to be part of it for some reason. I don't know, but we need to be from above. And he said, I said, therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins if you believe not that I am he. You will die in your sins. Wow, what a statement. What, a, what an amazing statement. Because that's what the world, when you're in the world, you're part of it. The washing of the feet with Peter. He had to, he, Peter says, wash all of me. No. You're not unclean, all of you. Only your feet are picking up things in the world. That's the only thing that needs to be washed. You are clean. Are clean. It's done. We're not trying to get clean. So, I don't need to live in fear. I, uh, you know, I can face tomorrow because he lives and because I've got the power of God in me. I, I, I can learn to live by faith because I've got the power of God in me. Believe God. Trust in God. And then uh, I don't need to talk about my weakness. I'm a new creation. I don't, I don't need to remind you of your weakness. We know that. I'm not going to speak about it here. That's not life. I'm going to speak about that you are dead unto sin and alive unto God. Dead unto sin, alive unto God. Your, your sin is because your old sin nature. You're dead unto sin. Stop resurrecting something that's dead. Stop digging it up. Stop being a grave digger. I mean, stop digging it up. Stop. Tr st don't give it mouth to mouth. Don't. It's dead. It's dead. You're not going to go into a funeral home and do that to somebody. That's gross. Don't touch nothing unclean. You don't need to do that, but you're associating with it. It's like the same thing. You are a new creation, and you have the power of God in you. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. We thank you that you teach us about wisdom, wisdom from above. I don't need to associate with nothing. Don't come in contact with nothing. But Christ and him crucified. The cross, it's an amazing place. This is the place where we go. The, you have an issue in your life. You have a problem in your life. We talked last week uh, in our wrap about having a um, a, a, a single eye, a single eye towards the cross, something that's very close. This needs to stay very close in our life so we can see it and know it and what it stands for. And any areas of the flesh, we come here.
This is where we go. This is where we go. That's the power of God. The cross is the power of God because it dealt with my sins. It dealt with your sins. Thank you, Father. We just praise you. We thank you. If there's somebody here today that has never accepted Christ and you want to give your heart to Christ, you believe in what Christ did upon this cross. He died for your sins. If there's somebody here that has never accepted him, uh, just lift up your hand real quick. I want to pray for you. Thank you, God. Yes. Anybody. Thank you, Lord. We just praise you. We thank you. Lord, uh, we uh, bless the closing song. Bless our offering. Bless our rap today. We thank you. Thank you for your people. Those that have to leave, Lord, just give them amazing week. Uh, living in the power of God. Living in the power of God. Try it for a little bit. Try it.